of God's word, shall we? Hey, let me pray um, as we open up the Bible. And if you have your Bibles and as I'm praying, if you want to open up to the book of Philippians, uh, we're going to finish up our study in Philippians today. So we'll be in Philippians chapter 4. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Um, as we were singing, I felt like um, we were declaring, like, like Melinda said in, in her prayer, we were declaring truths over ourselves. And the fact that that was the set that was chosen for today, the song selection, and practiced and prayed over, and then we sang it today, and I could sense that I needed to sing these things in my life, so I can only uh, assume and imagine that it, they were truths that we needed for today to be reminded of. So we thank you, Lord, that you are active in every part of our gatherings. Um, you are speaking to us. Your spirit is doing work in our spirits. And uh, so, Lord, we open your word now, and we place ourselves under it um, by holding it up in reverence. We know that you have direction for our lives. You have things you want to teach us. Uh, we're honored that you would speak to us. So as we finish up this study, Lord, we just ask that you would speak your word to our hearts, and we pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is the one I want. So if you're new to the bridge, let me just welcome you. Uh, if you are new to the bridge, if you could stand up. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to give a little caveat, if you are new, that um, today we are finishing something we've been going through for a while. We've been going through a New Testament book of the Bible called Philippians. It's a letter that Paul the Apostle wrote from house arrest in Rome back to a church that he had been to about 10, 12 years prior that was the first church in Europe, which would be cool. That's bragging rights. If you went to Europe today to where Philippi is, and you'd be like, yes, I'm sure there's several claiming to be the first church in Europe. Um, but yeah, uncharted waters for the gospel when Paul went there. You can read about the, the Philippian church planting account in Acts chapter 16. So as you're reading your Bible on your own, you want to look at it, go to Acts chapter 16 and you can read about what it looked like when Paul, how Paul even got there. It was a people he didn't even plan on meeting. He had plans to go to Ephesus. He always just had something in his heart and his mind for that region. But God said, nope, there's a group of people that need you and you need them. So you can read about it in Acts chapter 16. We've been going through it for the past few weeks. We've entitled the whole series, Jesus is Our Refuge. The whole point being that everything Paul has been talking about, there is a safe place. There is a content place. There is a secure place. There is a holy place in Jesus, with Jesus. So as we bring the letter of Philippians to a close, we are asking this question. So what are you saying, Lord? Because the Holy Spirit speaks through the word of God, and we are encouraged over and over in the word to hear what the Spirit is saying. So we read words on a page when we have scripture, but we don't want to ask ourselves, what am I reading? We want to ask, God, what are you saying? God has been speaking a lot of cool stuff to us in Philippians, and we don't want to just move on. So last week, we, we answered this question. So Lord, what are you saying to me as an individual? This week, we're going to ask the same question, but we're going to say it like this. We're going to say, God, what are you saying to us collectively? As Paul closes the letter, he does what he often does and what any good conclusion does. He circles back and repeats some things he has already said. The lesson has been taught. Now he gives the encouragement to put it into practice. So if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 13. So we'll re overlap one verse from last week. 
We'll have the verses on the screen, uh, or you can follow along in your Bible. Verse 13, chapter 4, Paul speaking, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Verse 14, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then there's a P.S. And let's read the P.S. P.S. Greet all of God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. Verse 22. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Wink, wink. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Those are our final verses. A lot in those verses. But when you know that Paul does what he always does when he is writing these epistles, he kind of spends the first part conveying some theological truths, some conveying, um, it's been said that Paul will often talk about doctrine in the first half and then duty in the second half. And I just think it's funny to say duty at church. And but there's always this sense of here's what we know or here's what we believe. And then there's this now here's what we do with it. And Paul will do this thing at the end of his letters where if, you, if you're noticing, he gets very machine gunny with his truths. It's like, kaka, 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 and they're just coming at you left and right. But it's a conclusion. And if any of you took English class, and I did a few times because I failed it twice, because I didn't like doing rough drafts and having someone edit it and be like, it's good, but it could be better. Write it again. And I'm like, no, I wrote it once. <laughs> and the Lord was like, bro, pay attention. I'm trying to tell you you're going to write for a living one day, and you need to know how to do this. Sidebar. What was I saying? <laughs> He's at the conclusion of his letter. And as any good conclusion does, it, it solidifies the truths you just unpacked and talked about. So, what are you saying to us, Lord? Now, we know the Lord is speaking to us as a people because we are the church. Paul was talking to a group of people, and we know that he's talking to us as individuals because we talked about what we did last week, and I, let me tell you, after last week, I've had several people come up and be like, the th stuff that you said, God has been showing me on my own. So we know the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and giving us those Holy Spirit high fives that I talked about where something that was said on church solidifies what God is saying to your own heart. And you're just like, and he's like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now keep going. So what are you saying to us? Lord? I just want to share three things this morning that kind of bleed off the page as I've been going through this. The first thing is this. The Lord is saying to us is the bridge. I'll just be specific. I, I believe these truths are for the whole church. But you know what? Like we've said before, the change we want to see out there starts in here. So we started our own dinner table before we move out around the world. So here's three things that the Lord's been saying to us. Number one, as the bridge, keep Jesus the main thing. Back in ver chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, 
I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. The gospel. Evangelion in the Greek means good news. In the New Testament, throughout all of, Bi all of the Bible, we know that the good news is that Jesus brings God to us through his life, death, and resurrection. The good news for us is that there is new life in Jesus. You could say there's a new way to be human in Jesus. Everything God has been saying points us to Jesus. All through Philippians. He is the one we worship, chapter 1. He is our refuge in storms. He is the one we rejoice in. He is the one we look to, chapter 2. His is the mindset we are to seek. His is the attitude we are to have. It is in him we place our confidence, not in ourselves, chapter 3. It is he that guards our hearts and our minds through prayer and trading in, like Melinda prayed earlier, we trade in what is untrue for what is true. And then we focus on what is true, and the God of peace will be with you. It is, it is he that is with us. It is he that walks with us. Keeping Jesus the main thing seems so simple. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be real practical today. Because when you ask the question, God, what are you saying? If you don't understand it and can't put feet to it in your own life, you may not understand what it is he's saying. And God wants you to know and us to know what he's saying. Keep Jesus the main thing. Easier said than done. In the book of Revelation in chapter, one of the first chapters, there are seven letters to seven churches, and one of the letters is to the church at Ephesus. They were the biggest church in the land. They were bawling out with all the stuff that they could do. But you know what it says that they had done? They had forgotten the main thing. And Jesus' encouragement to them was return to the things you had at the beginning when you were little, when you didn't have all the stuff. Return to your first love. Keep our first love our first love. So I want to ask a follow-up question. This is asking myself. You can ask it too. What is our church known for? What is our church, this church, known for? Not anymore. Amen. We can be known for many things. Well, we want to be noticed, known as the place where people can meet Jesus. Amen. Not just like that person, but this person. Why do I go to the bridge? Not just because I'm the pastor, um, although maybe sometimes that's the case, because I, like everybody, sometimes uh, church is difficult. And there are hard things, but I go to the bridge because I know it's a place where my kids, where my wife can meet Jesus face to face. They can come as they are. They don't have to be someone they're not. I don't have to be someone I'm not. I can just be me here because our mission is that people can meet Jesus, even people who don't know how to church. So we say we want to gather people to Jesus. What is our church known for? We want to learn from Jesus. That's why we prioritize the teaching and the communication of the Bible. Whether we're going through a book of the Bible like we did today or we teach a topic for six months straight, the goal is the same. We want to elevate God's word and place ourselves under it that we may learn from him, that we may grow in him. And then we want to live our lives as a response to him. Everything we do, we talk about it on our team meetings. Just so you guys get a look under the hood at how a Sunday morning runs and how we 
actually do everything on purpose. And the, here's the goal, that you would respond. When we're all done and we've sang, sung the first songs and you've been greeted by people and we have a break and you refill your coffee and you meet someone new and then we open up God's word and he speaks to us and then we respond with a song and then we say bye to someone and we walk out the doors. The whole goal every single week is that each one of you in your own life would respond to Jesus. That there would be a response God loves me. God cares for me. God has called me. He has purposes for me that I don't see for myself. So I go into Monday morning believing that Christianity is more than just a, something I put on. It's Christ in me, that crazy deep thing that we sang this morning. He is with me. He has forgiven me. He loves me. He's calling me. That's the response. But we have a group response as well. So we want to keep Jesus the main thing. It's what Paul has been saying all through Philippians. The second one is this. This one's a little, little harder. Jot this one down. The second thing. What are you saying to us, Lord? I believe he's saying this. Love the people you're with and the season you're in. Now, I rewrote that point this morning because up until this morning, the point was this. Um, learn from the season you're in and love the people you're with. And I couldn't get that Crosby, Seals, and Nash song out of my head, which is not what I was trying to say. I went back and listened to that song this week, and I was like, is there a deeper meaning here than what I've always thought from this song? And the answer is no. That's what that song is about. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. And, I, and it's catchy, but I've always thought that, like, that song is so bad. <laughs> That's horrible advice. Um, except for in, like, a crazy sexually pervasive culture. Oh, wait, we live in one of those. Um, for a lot of people, it's music to their ears. And so I reworded the point because I didn't want us to think that that's what I was saying. So here's what I do believe that the Lord is saying to us. Love the people that you're with and learn from the season that you're in. You know, life is made up of seasons. I've said it once. I'll say it a thousand times as we go forth into the future. Life is made up of seasons. We are in different seasons as people. Seasons, the period of time between what was and what will be, your current season, your current Station. Paul's current state was jail. He was under arrest. He couldn't leave. That's where he was, yet he said, in this place, Jesus is my refuge. In this place, I am content. In this place, I am a more than a conqueror. In this place, I want to make sure other people are doing okay. That was his current season. Because he had learned, because he had leaned into that season, and he got the most out of it. We live in a funny time. We can cater our whole lives to be what we want, even the season that we're in. We can cater every experience to our desires. We can build anything just the way we want it. Sometimes it's good. We design a house. We built it just the way we want it. Awesome. The hard part is when you build a house just the way you want it, it's like anything else in life. You forget something. And you're like, it's just the way we want it, except you can get whatever car you want. You can wear whatever type of clothing you want to wear. You can cater your thing. You can put whatever version of you you want out there on the Internet. You can build your life. The problem is, is we take that to everything like church. We're going to get deep for a second, and it's going to hurt a little bit. One of the most heartbreaking things ever is when people decide that a place isn't for them because the other people that they have to cross paths with. Because this mindset, this not liking the season that you're in, it crosses over into our relationships. That's why he says, be thankful in all circumstances, not for all circumstances, but there is something that in this circumstance, God, if you are a follower of Jesus, 
and you believe that somehow God is transforming you from glory to glory. He is transforming and renewing your mind and he is working all things together for good. Then you can't get what you're supposed to get out of next season until you learn what you need to learn in this season, namely contentment. We try to cater our lives just the way that we want, but then th something happens. Something comes along we didn't ask for. Something happens we didn't want to happen or we can't control. And then when we're left in that season, what do we do? Because life is hard. We get laid off. We get broken up with. We get sick. We get in accidents. We hear about heartbreaking things that happen to people that we love that we didn't sign up for. So what do we do? We try to get ourselves out of the season that we're in because it hurts so bad. And I believe one of the main truths that God has been speaking to us these past some weeks is that you don't have to get to a place for safety when you know that you're with a person. And that person of safety is Jesus, and he's with us in all circumstances. This idea spills over into our relationships as well. I want to say two things that are both true. We can choose who we allow to pour into us, and we can choose the relationships of people we're shoulder to shoulder with because the people that you are rub shoulders with rub off on you. We can choose who we pour into and who pours into us. That is true. So we want to surround ourselves with people you feel bring out the best in you. That is a true statement. This statement is also true. There are people in your life for a season that are there on purpose, that are difficult and different, and God has placed them there as well. The truth is we could cater our lives so that we never encounter people that are different from us. And it's been said the most segregated hour of the week in our nation is the hour on church, uh, hour on Sunday. And I don't know, statistically speaking, if that's true everywhere. I know that it's not. But it's just like we cater to this mindset so much that we even see it in the one place where, that should be the most diverse place in our lives should be where we worship God. Why? Because God loves every tribe, every tongue, every nation, all people, the rich, the poor, the beautiful, the, I mean, there's no ugly people, but God loves us ugly people too. But we could, Kate, I was having this conversation with one of my sons, that you could live in our city. And you could cater your life so much so that you could never cross paths with someone who doesn't look like you, with someone who stayed in a shelter last night and not in a home that they own, with someone that wears their brokenness visibly on their sleeve. But the truth is, if you don't cross shoulders with that, you'll never know that there's, there's hope for you. Let me not get off track. If we live like that, we will never understand two very important things. We will never understand the depth of God's love, and we will never understand the depth of God's grace. If we live in a place where we're not crossing paths with difficult people or people that aren't like us and... loving them, then I don't think you can understand the depth of what this means right here. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. It says this, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might probably dare to die. Like if someone's awesome, you might like save them and give up yourself. But it says, but God 
demonstrates how much he loves us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Like when we were enemies. So if you're not crossing paths with people that aren't like you, we can't understand the depth of what this means for us. We couldn't have, at the time when we were the most opposite from Jesus, as humanity, we put him on the cross and rejected him. It was in that moment that he showed how much he loves people. And yet we just have a hard time with being like, oh, that person kind of rubs me the wrong way. I don't like them. And it's just like, no, don't you understand? You rub God the wrong way. But he loves you so much that he's like, I'm going to show him what it looks like to love someone who is different. So he left his, his heavenly power somehow aside and came and humbled himself that he would see like he would give everything so we would just know that he loves them. But if we cater our whole lives to not be around difficult people, we just won't fully grasp as much as we can God's grace toward us. Something to think about. And we'll miss out, we'll never understand the depth of God's love and grace, and, and we'll miss out on this. Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 and 35, he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. That's not a suggestion. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Why? He says, because by this, everyone know that you are my disciples by this love you have for one another. The command to love one another is the thing that the world can't wrap their head around. They can understand um, piety. They can understand religiosity. They can even understand being wholeheartedly committed to a group or organization. But what they can't wrap their head around is that God does this thing in people where we love other people to the point that they're like, that is bizarre. <laughs> and, we're, and if we're honest, we're like, I know. It trips me out too. But the Lord is doing it. He says this is how they will know. Because we understand and believe if there is any place where people should be able to be who they are the most, it should be church. If there is any place where people, where you constantly talk and learn from people who are different than you, it should be church. If you are, con you should be constantly surprised by the depth and the insight from the people around you who don't look like you who don't have the same jobs as you, have the same gift set as you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is an equal opportunity employer and through the mouth of babes, God speaks. Amen. So when you hear about what your kid is learning and, and bridge kids and they come out, you should, it should minister to you because that's how God works. God has placed us together for this season. If there is another place, another church in our community that best suits you, that best suits your family, it's a better fit, look, I get it. Just make sure, and I would tell the same thing from someone coming here, because we've been talking about, oh, by the way, if you're new here, we've been talking about, I don't want to play church. I don't want to just do it, get inherited a broken system where people move around. We just want to love God and love people in the season that we're in. And so if you leave from one place to another, you have every right to do that. Some places are a better fit for you. And this might be the spot for you. It might be someone else. But make sure you're stepping towards something and not just away from something. If it's because of a, how a people are or the people that you're crossing paths with that you leave... I would be like, you might be running from the one thing that shows the world the power of God's love. It's not a guilt trip. It's just what we're being shown. 
Paul, tell these guys to work it out. Don't pull away. Push together because we're stronger together. There are people going through what you've gone through here. There are people that are going to go through what you have already been through, and you're going to go through some stuff that someone else has already been through. Do you understand now what it, when, the, when the Bible talks about the body of Christ, we're stronger together? All right, we'll move on to the next one. Actually, before we do, let me share one example, just personally. There's a time in my life where I was trying to pursue snowboarding as like a career. And when you're trying to look the part for something, you want to show all of your strengths and none of your weaknesses. Because you want to show that you're the bomb. The bomb. Uh, it's what we used to say <laughs> 15 years ago before it was, you get people said new stuff. The kids. Um, you want people to know that you're awesome. So we all have strong suits. But if we're honest, we all have things that we're not very strong at. So I remember I'd be at like these things and we'd be snowboarding and doing tricks and photographers would be there. And so what are you going to do? The stuff you're bad at or the stuff you're good at? Yeah, you're going to do the stuff you're good at. And the, here's the hard part is when you're not at the event or the thing and you're just on the hill with your buddies, you can never learn if you're only focusing on what you're good at because you're so concerned about what about showing your weaknesses that you can never learn any new tricks. And it's just like, oh, so-and-so is so good at that. But then you start to see after a while, they do the same four things all day, every day. And then you have people over here that are flailing a little bit off the jump, and you're like, oh, gosh, they look like a loose cannon. The truth is they're over here learning stuff. I'm glad for that season in my life because as a snowboarder, I got so much better when I became confident enough in myself and trusting enough with the people around me that I could be like, hey, I don't know how to do that trick. How do you do that? You have to get over the fact that someone would be like, you don't know how to do that? How could you not know how to do that? That's basic. Sorry. I don't know how. Do you guys see that the same and goes on in our faith journeys as well. Some people are going to hate because you can't do it, but haters going to hate. You can't please everybody, but you can please the Lord. And you can try to be a, the best version of yourself, but the same is in our faith stuff. Oh, you're a, you're a Christian and you said that mean comment to your spouse? How could you do that? Oh, you're a business owner and you never went to business school? Or how could you be a good mom and you're from a broken family? We see our weaknesses and we're, we, we're open to what the world wants to say, but we're just people opening ourselves up try to, trying to be better. People will never do it unless they feel like they're in a safe place that people that are invested in them as much as they are. How can you be a pro snowboarder and not know how to do this trick? How could you be a Christian and still struggle with sin? How could you be a fill in the blank? We want to learn from the season that we're in. And one of the ways of doing that is loving the people we're with, seeing the value in them. The last one is this. We want to prioritize giving, not getting. The verses that we read today, if we would have just taught them on their own, this was about giving. Verse 14, it was good for you to share in my troubles. In the early days, not one church shared with me in the manner of giving and receiving, just you only. He's like, this is a thing that he comes in at the end. It's one of the main topics because he spends a big chunk of text on it. But it was part of the whole thing at large. He was like, you guys were so awesome. If you follow Paul's journey, he was a tradesman. He had a job. 
And he even said, I've been broke before. Broke. And it was all good because God had me. And he's like, and I've been balling out before financially too. And that was great too. But it wasn't like when I had a lot, I was up here. When I had nothing, I was down here. He was like, I've always been right, right there, even keeled because I've been content because the Lord has me. But they were the church that supported him as a person. They got behind him financially. The Philippian church wasn't the biggest in the region. They weren't the wealthiest, that's for sure. Go back, look at Acts 16. They had this vast mix of people. Lydia, this rad entrepreneurial, I think I pronounced that right, businesswoman who was good at what she did. We had an ex demon possessed fortune telling young gal that when the demon was cast out of her she became basically a beggar good to good for nobody because she wasn't making her the people that had enslaved her she wasn't making them any money so she got cast aside so she was getting nothing so we had business owner we had homeless little girl and we had blue collar guy in the middle the 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 prison jailer that beat the tar out of Paul and Silas and had him in the inner stocks. And, that's, and, and he's the one that, well, go back and read it. But he's the one who radically gave his life and he said, what must I do to be saved? Because when Paul and Silas were in their chains, the season that they were in and the bonds came out, they didn't run out of the jail and be like, yeah, we're out of here. This government's horrible. They were in the season they were in because God had a hold of their hearts. And then when the jailer was like about to kill himself because he was responsible for them, and he ran in and he fell down. Why? Because there was something in him. And this is what he said, what must I do to be saved? Deep down underneath it all, what was it that that Philippian jailer wanted more than anything? Obviously, it's peace with God because he didn't say, tell me how to withstand a huge beating. Tell me how to this. He says, what must I do to be saved? They were a generous, giving people. They knew what they had in Jesus, so they willingly gave what they had to God on others. I want to give a couple of thoughts on generosity and two practical applications. From what we learned from Philippians and what the Lord is saying to us. Some thoughts on generosity. Generosity fights the fleshly desire that says, I want more. We live in a world of more. Contentment comes from enough. Humi just like humility is the antidote to pride, generosity is the antidote to selfishness. I love watching kids play. They instinctively do stuff that we have to be taught as adults. They instinctively want people to fit in and belong. They instinctively share, unless they're siblings at home. <laughs> then something else happens. I still haven't figured it out. But you watch kids in the back. I guarantee you, you go in the back right now, and the, the, the rule, not the exception, is generosity. It's the antidote to selfishness. It fights that thing in us that says, I want more, I need more. When you give it something away, it says, I have enough. Doesn't mean we don't work hard. Doesn't mean we try to build and grow. It fights this fleshly desire for more. The second thing, another thing, it's the front door to contentment. We think somehow as like Jesus people or as I don't know exactly the words for it, but we think getting to the place where we become financially generous is like in the third floor, in the corner office, up the back stairwell of the building, and once we've been a Christian for a long time and learn how to navigate and pray and all this stuff, then we'll find this room. We're like, oh, there it is. That's the generosity room. I've arrived. Financial generosity is the lowest fruit 
front door to the Christian life. It's the first thing, not the hundredth thing, that shows contentment in one's life. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So put your treasure where you want your heart to be. These people, they weren't that big. And three times they were rallying the troops and be like, we're building the kingdom. Let's support Paul. How can we, how can we do what it is that God has called us to do and not have the heart to get, but have the heart to give? A generous person is a content person. Proverbs eleven twenty five. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Do you believe that? It's the front door to commitment. Another thing about generosity, it demonstrated care. It shows that we care about what God cares about. For God so loved the world that he gave. When we give of ourselves to God's kingdom, it shows that we care about what he cares about. Another thing about giving, this one will trip you out. It goes farther than you think. What did he say about their gift? It was a gift. It was pleasing. A sacrifice. It cost something. wasn't leftovers. And it said it was a fragrant offering unto the Lord. It was like when you come in from a long bike ride and you smell tacos. You're like, yes. Your giving goes farther than you think. It doesn't just go to the thing that a church is trying to do. It says it goes all the way to the throne of God. Not the amount you give, but the generosity of heart goes all the way. And God goes, Man, that smells good. And generosity is more than finances. For example, what's your most valuable commodity? Parents, if you don't know this, I'm sure you do. Your most valued commodity is time. Kids spell rich, T-I-M-E. We want to provide for our kids. Our kids just want to be with us. That's a tough one, dads. I'll admit it. Because you want to be out and providing. But here's both things, two things that are true. You need to provide for your family. You want to provide for your family. And time is what your kids need most. And there is a dilemma that we can't fix on our own, but I promise God will lead you through. Time is our most valuable commodity. So, two practical applications. Look for any and every opportunity to show love for another person, whether it be financially or with your time, in our group setting. Are you involved? Do you have the mindset of, I get when I go to church, or I'm a part of a church? That's the deeper thing. Look for opportunities to build one another up. Look for opportunities to serve. And then last but not least, look for opportunities to bring others in. Greet all of God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greeting. Verse 22, all God's people here send you greeting, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Caesar, Nero, was not a nice guy. Eventually would have Paul killed. He had a lot of servants and slaves, people he had taken from their families and different things and put them into his service. He was an oppressive ruler. Those belonging to Caesar's household, those under the oppressive rule of Nero, those under the oppressive rule of, a world, of the world who are hungry for something more. How many people are like that in our world? Um, everybody. Everybody is under the oppressive rule of the world. I'm not talking about like the American government. I'm talking about the devil. I'm talking about the desire that if I get more, I will feel better. I will be more. I'm better than that person. Pride. Everybody is under that oppressive rule. But when we 
here what God is saying to us is the church, and we are a part of something. We give to something. We are invested in something, and we are focused on bringing other people into this place. I believe we will see the kingdom grow. So we're going to take communion here in a sec as a response. But I want to point out a strength of this church. Here's something that I've heard about the bridge. I've heard more these past few years than I've heard the previous 20 combined. And this is not a, this is not a brag because we have tons to grow in. This is just something that I've heard. I've heard this. I was invited here by. Like, some, like I meet someone, hey, how's it going? We get to talk and then like, I was invited here by. Typically a neighbor, coworker. Another thing I've heard is, I felt welcome immediately. People will talk to me and we'll go get coffee or something and they'll just be like, man, when I came in, I, someone said hi to me and they'll say you, some of you by name, and they're like, I felt so welcome straight away. And this is one that I've heard and that I've experienced myself. I've heard people say, this is the first church I've ever invited my friends to. It's the first, the first one in a long time that I have. You know why? Because I know that when people come, all that stuff we talked about today, we're striving for that. We're wanting more of that. And we know that people can come as they are. Not, not to just never change in their lives, but because they'll meet Jesus here. They'll meet other people following Jesus here. Are you guys with me? All right. We look tired. It's all right. It's hot. I talk a lot. But this is what the Lord is speaking to us as a group of people. So I'm thankful for this few weeks in the book of Philippians. I'm going to pray as I pray. Worship team is going to come up. We're going to sing. We're going to pass communion out during the song. And then I'll come up when the song is nearing an end. And we're going to take communion together. So will you guys hold it? So as God has been speaking to us as a group, we can seal what he has been, we can seal it, what he has been saying, and then we'll take communion together, all right? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, for the book of Philippians written to a group of people a long, long time ago, but could have been written directly to us. That's how your spirit works. You take what is in your written word and then you tattoo it on our hearts. We love you, Lord. We sing this song just as a response to your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.